So where do we start? Well, I think the easiest approach is to think head to toe, and that way you can stay organized as a parent. So let's talk about your child's head first. Now we do know that heads grow quite a bit in the first year as the brain grows, but the fontanelles or soft spots generally start to close by 15 to 18 months. So when do we worry about the head? I think as pediatricians we worry if the head uh, grows too briskly, starts to jump percentiles on the growth chart, because that tells us that something inside is driving that force that may not be healthy for your child. And especially if it's accompanied by abnormal eye movements, meaning eyes wiggling up and down or back and forth or crossing, and the head just seems to be more prominent or the forehead is more prominent with some uh, blue veins that suddenly turn up, those are signs that the head circumference is probably growing out of proportion to the child. On the other side of the spectrum is a head that refuses to grow, one that flattens out or levels in the percentiles rather than continuing along a normal growth curve. Because that could mean that the sutures or seams of the skull are closing prematurely and then the brain doesn't have enough room to move and it moves against this force and that can be destructive to a child's development. Uh, there are some syndromes and some uh, uh, genetic conditions in children whereby the head has a small head circumference as an expected finding. And again, we still have concerns about that developing brain beneath. Uh, the other thing with your child's head is that it's very likely in the first year or two that your kiddo is going to hit their noggin somewhere along the line because as they start to crawl, as they start to walk, their head is still big in proportion to their body. And if you've ever seen little kids run, they lead with their head. And although their brain tells them to stop, their body can't stop quickly enough. Mm -hmm. And so often we see tons and tons of toddlers with big bruises on their head. So when do we worry about those kind of knocks on the noggin? Well, the good news is that most typical bangs against the table edge or even a fall down onto the floor from standing rarely result in anything but a big bruise that looks like a cartoon egg coming out of the head. Uh, where we do worry is that if a child has a high velocity fall, so for example if they're on a swing at a park and they somehow slip out of that swing or if they somehow manage to get on a piece of furniture that's four or five feet tall and go airborne down to the ground. Those are injuries that are related, uh, related to more speed and generally the, the banging that the brain takes uh, under those circumstances is generally perceived to be more risky for the child. So if your child is just toddling down the hallway and bangs their head on a wall, cries and recovers quickly, has a bruise that you can get ice on, you give them some pain relief and you can watch them for an hour or two to make sure that nothing else is going on like recurrent vomiting or an alteration in their being. Basically, you can tuck them into bed, check on them maybe once at night and you're, you're good to go. But I think if there's any falls where there's, a, you know, say they're running full tilt, full tilt, and then into a concrete wall, again, that speed mixed with a bang uh, probably requires a doctor's visit or at least a call to your doctor. Mm -hmm. And believe me, it's going to happen to all of you. Now, as far as other things that are going on with the head, uh, you will see sometimes, uh, I lost my train of thought, it left the station. Actually, I covered it. Okay, so if you can just edit that little piece out, that would be yep. fine. Yep. Okay. All right. Are we still on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Eyes. Uh, so I'm going to do skin now. Skin, yeah. Okay. So we're at the head, we're talking about bruising, so let's talk about skin now. As your baby grows, usually by about two months of age, all babies go through a period of what's called pallor or paleness. And that's when they run out of mom's blood cells and that creates a relative state of anemia or low iron. That triggers the bone marrow to make their own blood cells and then babies on to manufacturing their own blood. So they get pink again by four months of age. So when would we worry about skin and skin color? Well, I think if a baby is normally pink and flushed and looking very healthy and suddenly or insidiously over a long period of time develops a paleness or pallor, that is a reason to think of a couple of things. One is nutritionally, is this child getting enough iron? Two, are they stressed from uh, illness 
or three, is there another reason for the paleness, like a heart condition or a lung condition? So I think as a parent, if you feel that your baby is pale for any prolonged period of time, uh, it's reasonable to bring this up to your doctor. And typically in the office, we're gonna check your baby's iron nutritionally somewhere around a year anyway, as a baby is transitioning off breast or bottle to regular milk. And so uh, that certainly is a, is a good uh, time to discuss any concerns that you have, but certainly any time after that, if your baby appears to be pale, it's a good, it's a good thing to do. Bruising, we do expect, and as I alluded to before, our babies get a lot of trauma to their foreheads and sometimes to their mouths. So they'll bang their faces on things, they'll fall to the ground and sometimes get a split lip or, or uh, a bruise on their, on their face. But the other typical place where they get bruises is the front of the shins because that's where they bump into everything. We do too, as a matter of fact. So we've just talked about your toddler getting bruises on their noggins, so we might as well talk about skin. Now skin is one of those organs that's so important to us. It's our first line of immune defense for babies. So if the skin is broken, if the baby has scabs that are not only at the uh, location of a cut uh, or an injury, but also that spread, that's called impetigo, and that means that there's a secondary infection of the skin. That's a reason to get to your healthcare provider. If we see pustules, which look like adolescent zits on our kid's skin, that's also a reason to believe that a child may have a staph infection. And if we see fluid-filled blisters that either are a result of things like chicken pox or even a herpes infection from a well-meaning parent planting a, a kiss on a body part, those are reasons to get to your doctor as well. Now, as far as other things going on with the skin, paleness or pallor are something that don't really belong with a child because our kids are so well-nourished, typically in the first year of life, that they're pink and healthy and absolutely active. However, when they make that transition from breast or bottle to regular milk and when their appetite drops in the second year and they may not eat so much iron, they may have nutritional anemia that shows up as paleness, sometimes fatigue, sometimes listlessness. They can have paleness or pallor from things like heart disease or unrecognized chronic illness. So if you see your child look translucent or kind of ashen or gray, it's so, so important for your doctor to know about that no matter what their age. And lastly, with bruising, we do expect bruising on their heads and on their shins. That's just where they bang into their environment. But if you start to see big bruises on places that don't make sense, like in the middle of the back or on their belly or places on their arms where there has not been trauma or even on their head when there has not been trauma, and especially if there's any paleness or any fatigue attached to that, your doctor should know about that immediately. And the opposite end of the spectrum, if there are tiny, tiny pinpoint little purple marks that are anywhere below the neck, those are called... Yeah, those are called. You could just say, and the opposite end okay. is... Okay. And another kind of bruise called petechiae is something that's particularly alarming for us because it may indicate that your child's clotting ability called platelets is diminished. What do petechiae look like? Well, if you ever went to summer camp when you were a kid and rubbed your friend's wrist as a best friend and gave them an Indian rug burn, you saw tiny pinpoint little purple dots on, on the skin. Those are called petechiae. Now, typically if a child has a low platelet count, the petechiae will sort of come over a rapid period of time, generally over 24 to 48 hours, and they're pretty obvious to parents. So if you see that happen, it certainly is a reason to immediately get to your healthcare provider. The good news is that a lot of petechiae that we see are from viral illnesses, and they don't mean that the platelet count is abnormal, but there are instances where that platelet count is so low that it could pose harm to your child. So check out all petechiae and all unusual bruising and any pallor or paleness with your doctor. Everybody can put their head on the pillow at night if we check it out the same day or within 24 hours. The last thing I want to talk about is moles and growing lesions because we always think of those things as adult problems or things that we worry about in adults when in fact children can have growing birthmarks uh, that can encroach on their vision or and their ability to swallow or breathe comfortably. So if your child has a birthmark near any of the eyes, nose, or throat, especially if it's a, it looks like a mulberry or raspberry, it's called a hemangioma. If that birthmark starts growing uh, and looking like it's interfering with basic functions like breathing and eating, that's really an urgent uh, reason to get to your doctor. Moles. 
Now, children usually are not born with moles. It's rare occasion, but in the first two years of life, if a parent is moly, or if both parents are moly, then holy moly, your kid is probably going to show up with a few as well. So if they're just light brown and they've got nice smooth edges and they stay the same size, no big problem. But just as with children, if they start to grow, change in color, look like a fried egg or have a jigsaw puzzle kind of periphery on them, those moles, even in young children, should be checked out either by your doctor or by a dermatologist. Yeah. And lastly, one of the maladies we see in preschools a lot are called molluscum contagiosum. And this is a rash that is not an emergency, but kind of becomes a panic factor in a lot of families because it is a viral illness of the skin. It's kind of our millennium's form of wart. And what it basically looks like is a little head of a pin with a little depression in the middle of it. And typically your child may get a cluster here, a cluster there. They don't have any symptoms, they're not scratching, but they seem to spread all over the body and within siblings or within families, we may see them erupt. And so if you do see something that looks like the head of a pin with a little dimple in the middle, and especially if they're spreading kind of wildly, make sure you check in with your doctor because there are some ways that we can really stave off the, the, the spread of these and also reduce some of the contagiousness within the family. They'll never hurt a kid, they'll never scar them, but they kind of scar the psyche of a family because they are hard to get rid of, and so the earlier the better. So that's it for skin.